So at this time, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce a very special guest with us this morning, a leader whose record reflects the USC Price School's commitment to outstanding service and to improving communities, Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. Los Angeles is also the ideal place for holding this summit as a global mega city with ties around the world, but also with a population that really reflects so many communities around the world as well. One of the things that Mayor Garcetti is really known for is the substantial revitalization of the communities under his leadership that he has represented when he was in the city council. He was in, elected as a LA City Council president uh, four times. For 12 years, he represented the 13th council district covering Hollywood, Echo Park, Silver Lake, and Atwater Village. And each of those places experienced substantial revitalization during that time. He is also known for being a fourth generation Angelino having grown up in San Fernando Valley. And that may not sound special, but when you think of it, most of us here came from somewhere else, including me. And so it's very special that he has these deep roots uh, in Los Angeles. But he's broadly educated. He has his BA and MA from Columbia University. He studied at Oxford University and the London School of Economics as a Rhodes Scholar. And he has taught at both USC and Occidental College. And interestingly, he's also a lieutenant in the US Navy Reserve. In addition, I want to mention that Mayor Garcetti has been a great friend of the USC Price School throughout his tenure. He's headlined our Veterans Affairs Conference with General Petraeus. He spoke at the Unite for Veterans Summit to eliminate veteran homelessness with Michelle Obama, which the Price School co-hosted. And together, the city of LA partnered with USC Price's Center for Economic Development to successfully secure a federal designation for Southern California as a manufacturing community, which gives the re region preferential treatment to federal government funding for local aerospace and advanced manufacturing industries. And what you may not be aware of is that right as this conference is going on, in Tudor Hall, we are having our uh, annual conference sponsored by CED with 150 local manufacturing firms. Uh, and I just spoke at that conference just a half hour ago. Uh, and we want to thank uh, Mayor Garcetti for partnering with us on that very important economic development effort. As dean, it also makes me very proud that several of our distinguished Price School alumni are working in the mayor's office. From transportation to housing to resiliency and security. So contributing together to the efforts to make our city much better in the future. So it's my great pleasure and please join me in welcoming Mayor Eric Garcetti. It is really coming home to be here. Um, and thank you for your leadership. Um, it's coming home to be here because my father was a scholarship student here. I was a teacher here. My grandfather used to cut the hair of USC professors as an immigrant from Mexico. This place has wound its way into my life and so many rich threads in the tapestry uh, that has informed the decades I have been here. And I always love coming into this room um, because I get to see Connie Rice mostly uh, half the time, uh, friends like Earl Pacinger. I uh, get to be with so many people who are committed to so much change. And there's a, a strange thing about USC, which is the interconnectivity of this crazy, chaotic place that we call home, Los Angeles. Uh, the movie Crash, I always think, was the best metaphor because we just kind of crash into each other here. We find these moments and these places and these things that bring culture together, that bring ideas together, that bring people together. And this intersection, this vital, critical, needed intersection, today that we talk about is exactly the fertile ground that we always tend to here at USC, a place where we can put out those truths like the ones we just heard, those difficult truths, and work our way through them in order to find a way to have a more peaceful and prosperous city and world around us. This world-class university brings together the best and the brightest, and it's no different here today. 
Um, and it's also fitting that this University of Southern California <laughs> is here in Los Angeles, a place that is now the third largest metropolitan economy in the world after Tokyo and New York, practically a trillion dollar economy just here in the Los Angeles area, a place of 18 million souls, the most diverse collection. I actually heard Connie say this first at a, something over at the LA Times, not just the most diverse city on the face of the earth today, but ever in human history by most measures, and the measure that I like the best actually came out of USC, a research report, the Ethnic Quilt, many years ago. Uh, we have 39 countries with the largest population outside their home country here. We have over 200 languages spoken, over 120 countries of origin. When we were bidding for the Olympics, we really could say in good conscience, every athlete, whether they've been here or not, will come to Los Angeles, and it will be like her second home. She'll find people who speak her language, who come from her town, who eat her food, who practice her religion, who understand her culture. And I think for those of us who grew up here seeing the face of the world on the streets of Los Angeles, those of us lucky enough to leave Los Angeles for work or for study have also found the inverse to be true, that you can see the face of Los Angeles on the streets of the world. And it isn't just a remark about our demographics, but I hope increasingly about our values and our morals and who we are and what we can export and reclaim something that is quintessentially both American and universal, to claim those American values that we want to promote in the world instead of closing ourselves off from. But since time immemorial, it is the act of violence that has probably been, for human beings, the greatest challenge to living healthy and complete lives from even before history through early history. It is really a history so many times of violence, of wars fought, of conflicts engaged in. And while the big ones make the history books, it is pretty safe to say there is no human being whose lives and whose family lives do not interact at some point with violence. But the test for us is not whether or not violence will visit us, but what we do to confront it and what we do to react to violence both individually and collectively. The courage of the speakers you heard here today, who individually can speak up and transform, and it takes as much courage to unhate as it does to love. To find those spaces collectively where we can come together in conversations. I was with the president of Israel yesterday who's visiting, and I was remarking to the consul general how two iterations before him, I remember being in the city council, and the consul general of Israel and his wife, and the consul general of Egypt and his wife were sitting uh, the four of them in the front row of the uh, seats at city council. The Israeli consul general at the time's wife was an Egyptologist and deeply knew the culture of Egypt and they had become friends. And how improbable and almost impossible that would have been if they were in their home countries, if they were in the region in the Middle East to be able to open those spaces and those places that here in Los Angeles we take for granted and find natural. And it's not something that is old in this city, even though I do like telling the stories that we, of course, were founded before Washington, D.C. was, that if we trace the uh, racial background of those pobladores, settlers who came here because the Spanish were obsessed with every quarter and eighth, each one of us, I would have been very confusing to them, like many of you. But they had 42 individuals who traced their ancestry back to Africa, to Asia, to the Americas, and to Europe. And yet we also had some of the darkest stories of racial conflict and violence here. The, the largest mass lynching in American history happened right here in our town, ladies and gentlemen, when dozens of Chinese Americans were uh, hanged here in the downtown area because of a race riot um, that was sparked downtown. And Latinos and Anglos went after Chinese, innocent Chinese on the streets, strung them up without trials and killed them. We see amazing breakthroughs here we see the civil rights struggles that didn't just happen in other places, but that happened here in Los Angeles. So we have a rich history to draw from, not just of that conflict, but also of the potential. Uh, and that's why today, as we see that interconnectivity, I wasn't here to hear what Connie said, but I think the two of us are of a like mind, that this is a discussion today of how we connect these pieces. Violent extremism is really about the violence as much as it is about any extremism. Violence, by its definition, is extreme to inflict pain or to take someone's life or to try to attempt to do that. That is what is the extremism. And for each one of us to try to unplug from that and find the reasons why that happens, we have to see the interconnectivity of violence. At this moment when we speak of so many women and many men who are speaking up and speaking out about sexual violence and harassment in their lives and domestic violence in this moment, 
uh, when it was just Domestic Violence Month last month, we see that those things connect to the biggest challenges we face. This, the homeless capital of America, 92% of the women on the streets of the city and probably a high percentage of the men come from households where they as children or adults were victims of domestic and or sexual violence. When you talk to women who are coming out of the criminal justice system, over 90% of them too experience that same violence as well. And if we don't want that to repeat or to manifest and to attach itself like a barnacle to the ideologies of hate, the different manifestations of these um, kind of noxious ideologies that we can find in every religion and every approach, we have to make sure that we understand the violence that undergirds them as well. Because the manifestations, whether it's in Kabul, or Mogadishu, whether it's in Paris or Brussels, I remember just over a year ago being on this campus when Hillary Clinton as a, cam as a candidate for president was coming to visit and she was gonna give a speech on something completely different when the attacks in Brussels happened. And suddenly we got a call saying, can we change what we're talking about? And we sat down and we showed what this city is about. We showed Muslim and Jewish and Christian leaders coming together to talk about a universal vision for peace and for reducing violence. We made sure that we don't single out one type of violence and one ideological attachment to violence, but that we admit that it happens in every part of the ideological spectrum. And what we recognize too is increasingly this is something that is homegrown. It's kind of like the conspiracy theories, most conspiracy theories people have in politics. I remember my first week on the city council, I was sitting next to a former councilwoman named Ruth Galanter, because it's alphabetical, Galanter Garcetti, and this had to do about a land use project and somebody who was at the public speaker podium said, you know, I'm opposed to this, but I know you guys are all bought and paid for by the developer who's given you donations and this vote doesn't mean anything. And she turned to me, Riley, and said, you know the problem about conspiracy theories, Eric? None of us are smart enough to pull them off. And unfortunately, except in those rare cases, most of this violence is not some master conspiracy coming out of a centrally planned place. In some ways, that would be easier to take out whether it was militarily, whether it was in police action. It is unfortunately decentralized and homegrown. It is in the minds of individuals now as much as it is about groupings that come together. So how do we, where do we go from here? How do we uh, stop violence perpetrated by individuals who are hidden in plain sight? Los Angeles is home to the best law enforcement, I believe, in the world and the partners to law enforcement, the gang reduction and youth development programs we have, the understanding of our domestic violence programs, our, our deep roots of attacking our problems by looking at where violence starts instead of how they finally end. And our partnerships with state and local, uh, sorry, and federal agencies, I think are unmatched too. It doesn't matter what administration is in power in Sacramento or in Washington. When it comes down to this, we have professionals who are part of the same team. If you've never been to our Joint Regional Intelligence Center, you'll see it. People aren't there wearing their agency hats. They're there to protect their own backyards and neighborhoods, thinking together as single teams. Those who are out there engaging in communities are community partners who have been part of what we've done, the friends, the family, the neighbors, those who are closest to individuals who may be on a path towards violence are just as much part of that same team as well. But too often there are still too many people too isolated and their loved ones and their associates who don't know where to turn. That's really what today is about. You heard this morning from people like Angela King, who was bullied relentlessly as a teenager, felt completely alone when her parents went through a messy divorce. You heard her story. Where, is she still here? I don't want to, back here? Okay. okay, she's being interviewed. But the way that her violence manifested by finding home and belonging in a neo-Nazi group, by assaulting the owner of a Jewish-owned business and spending eight years in prison, if a teacher had recognized that bullies were pushing her to an increasingly isolated place, we might have had an intervention. If a neighbor had seen her body with the tattoos, the swastika tattoos on it, called on local support, um, they might have had a different story to tell today. And Mubin Shaik, who described his acute identity crisis before traveling to Pakistan, fell, falling under the spell of people who peddled a vision of religion that distorted the most basic tenets of Islam, that used that faith as an excuse for barbarism, and the 9-11 attacks that made him reconsider in the face of violence the courage that took to unhate and to unwind that violence, now his work as an expert in countering violent extremism. But what if somebody at his mosque could recognize that earlier, taking him through to help? We need to offer at every level these viable alternatives to what all of us go through in some point of our life. 
the turmoil and the trauma that faces us when family changes happen, when there's poverty around us, when we look at uh, opportunities that are missed, we need to make ensure that we are supporting community-led efforts, not top-down, but from kind of a horizontal access out. Violent extremism thrives when people of different religions or ethnicities pull away from each other, when we are able to articulate they instead of us. And the best way forward is to find the common threads that pull us <coughs> towards each other. Los Angeles became the first city grab a little water, <coughs> to designate, first big city, I got it, sorry, uh, to designate a director who's coming up right here to help me with water, uh, Jumana, and I want to thank you for your leadership. Jumana Silian Saba uh, has been a leader not just here in Los Angeles, but nationally, um, and with a team that is as committed in our quote-unquote anti-terrorism, our anti-extremism agenda, to looking at the local level and at the personal level as much as we are at the law enforcement effort, our Strategies Against Violent Extremism program has become a model because we approach this as a public health, a public health risk. We look at this as a public health crisis. And central to that has been our pilot program called Safe Spaces, which actively works with our communities to eliminate stereotypes, to have those conversations too many Americans don't have anymore. And think about the remarkable journey in just two and a half decades this city has been through. Think about this if this was after the unrest that visited us in 1992. The entire country and world was saying our difference was something that was going to tear us apart and ultimately defeat us. A couple years ago after I became mayor, uh, Mayor Park of Seoul uh, was visiting here. And after he toured around for a while, he said to me, how do we get to be more like you? And I'll always take a compliment from another mayor, but I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, we've had such an amazing economic miracle in Korea. Seoul is very prosperous, but we understand that we're too monolithic. Our culture is too singular. And if we can't find a more pluralistic society like yours, we won't succeed. This is your great strength. And I was kind of breathless that within a single generation, we, have, we had went from our diversity being something that would tear us apart to being something that was envied around the world. And figuring a way to stitch that together and to draw that piece is what these conversations are all about. How do we build community wellness? How do we find not the superficial conversations? I can remember those after the riots when we tried to get Koreans and African Americans to sit down and tell me about your culture. Well, tell me about your culture. And then those were nice for a day, but they didn't really go anywhere. It wasn't until we started working on common projects together of economic development, of ridding a neighborhood of gang violence or building a park, that we realize that's what overcomes those beliefs. When people have a stereotype of individuals, they've never worked with them. Let the commonality come out when you're working together, not just through a conversation where you're forced to talk about your differences and somehow learn to embrace them. In less than six months, we've been taking this approach and Safe Spaces has reached nearly 4,000 people. They connect Angelinos to clinical psychologists and support groups that can make the difference between choosing violence and choosing love or at least connectivity. And there's not a one size fits all approach. Uh, they aren't headed by law enforcement. They're community specific and community led because their on the ground perspective really gives us that gritty nuance that we need from the neighborhood, a more sophisticated understanding of what draws people towards violence and towards extremism. We know that hate groups exploit isolation, that they exploit hate, that they allow people to feel that their problems are about the injustice visited them upon them by others. And we see that sort of irresponsible exploitation at the highest levels all the way down to the neighborhood, um, the neighborhoods where we live. But we offer is something different, a picture of justice, support, of pluralism uh, upon which this city and this nation was founded. You know, we're taking these lessons too and networking with each other. When we were lucky enough this year to convince the world, or at least the 100 and something voters that represent the International Olympic Committee around the world, that they should come back to this campus, to the city, and have a third Olympiad here in Los Angeles, it was a really fascinating conversation. There's no question that the world holds America to a higher standard. But when we were in the midst of those conversations, there was like, everybody said, there's the America we love to hate, and there's the America we love to love. And in many ways, Los Angeles embodies, or we convince them that Los Angeles more embodies the latter than the former. A place where we can come together and 
share with the world how this crazy crashing experiment of Los Angeles succeeds more often than it fails. And I just came back two weeks ago from Paris where I stood with Mayor Anne Hidalgo who will have the Olympics in 2024 in her city. And we signed a pact together of inclusion to work together, two cities getting ready for the Olympics, them in seven years and us in, ten, well, six and a half and us in 10 and a half years. And looking at what we could do to address pluralism, to address violence, to address isolation, to address poverty, to address development together, two cities, continents and oceans away, but really united by that same common purpose. I stand with her, I stand with London Mayor Sadiq Khan, and our joint efforts to build these sort of healthy, inclusive visions of what cities should be in the future. I'll close with this. The Greek word for city and for politics were the same, polis, the same root. In the back, in the old days, in the ancient Greek city-state, Politics wasn't seen as something dirty. It was actually seen as something noble, necessary, responsible. It was what we were all called to engage with. And at that level, it was a very personal level of politics. I don't mean personal in the sense of trolling people on a Twitter feed. I don't mean in looking at responding to the latest uh, crazy thing that somebody has said. It was politics in the more intimate sense of getting to know one another, of negotiating, of compromising, of figuring out who we were. And it is for good reason now that the city, I think, is the ideal platform to engage at that level. We can have national policies and we love our federal support for the efforts that we are doing here and thank our federal partners for that. We love that the state is engaged in such a powerful way with us too. But we ultimately have to do is bring this back to the individual and the community level, to stand for peace, to stand for justice, to commit ourselves to the transformations uh, that are between us. It was Dostoevsky who said, and I'll paraphrase, it's easy to love humanity. The difficult work is learning to embrace your neighbor. In other words, we all say we're for world peace until that person's a little different from us or they play their music too loud or they speak a different language or they're just annoying to us, whatever it is. That's where we should be drawn towards, figuring out where we find the commonality in that which maybe doesn't attract us but pushes us away. Because I guarantee you those conversations are the places where you find peace. Not with those you already know and love, not with those who are like you, but those who push you towards a place that will not only expand who they are, but will grow ultimately who you are as a human being in our time on earth. Thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you, Thank you Mayor, for that uh, very articulate, compassionate, and uh, informative speech. And we also really appreciate your wonderful leadership of this great city and your leadership on this issue. I think he deserves one more rousing applause for all the work that he does for Los Angeles. Thank you very much.